installment of Water Wednesday. My name is Catherine Horn, and I am a Community Affairs Representative at East Bay Mud, and I'm going to be your host tonight. Water Wednesday is a recurring East Bay Mud event every third Wednesday of the month, where we talk about important topics pertaining to our water and watershed. Tonight's discussion is unfortunately a very topical one right now in California. Um, we're going to be discussing the other F word, fire. Um, we're going to be talking about how East Bay Mud prevents wildfires from occurring in our watershed, how we work to ensure that water stays on during high-risk fire events, and we'll have some tips and resources available for you to inform you how you can landscape your own home to reduce your risk. All of our Water Wednesday events will be recorded and posted within a week of the event for your viewing at ebmud.com slash waterwednesday. By attending tonight's event, you do consent to being virtually recorded. If you are interested in viewing the last two Water Wednesdays, um, our last one, uh, last month focused on um, what you can do to conserve water in your own home, and the uh, one in June um, focused on uh, the current drought and water supply uh, situation. You can check out those out online as well. Next month on September 15th at 6 p.m., we're going to be having a really fun topic. Um, it's called A Mastodon Drink Your Water and We Can Prove It, where we'll be talking about a recent exciting find in our watershed. Also, um, after this event tonight, we're going to be randomly selecting three participants uh, to receive a copy of East Bay Mud's native plant book. So for those selected, we'll be contacting you by email. And if you don't win a book tonight, please come back next month for another shot. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, we are going to be utilizing the Q&A function throughout the event. You have East Bay Mud's uh, Community Affairs Representative, Lindsay Edelman, who's going to be trying to address your questions as we go. And we'll also reserve some time at the end to address some questions. If you have questions that are really specific to your own personal home, your circumstances, or your situation, um, please email them to waterwednesday at ebmud.com. And I'll be sharing that email address again at the end of the program. With that, I'm going to move on to our PowerPoint so that I can introduce our speakers and briefly go over our agenda for tonight. going to take just a minute to pop up. Okay, so for tonight, our first presenter is going to be Chuck Beckman, who is going to be discussing fire management and prevention on East Bay Mud's watershed. Chuck is a manager of watershed and recreation for the McCallany Division and has worked in East Bay Mud's Natural Resources Department for the last 10 years, half of the time here in our East Bay watershed and half of the time in our McCallany watershed. Chuck is then going to turn it over to Damon Hom, who will discuss how our water system is equipped to deliver fire suppression. Damon has been with East Bay Mud for 20 years. He is the superintendent of water distribution in our operations department where he oversees the daily operation of the water system from the water treatment plant to the customer. And finally, I'm gonna be highlighting some tips from our East Bay Mud's Firescape booklets that can help you protect your own home from fire and provide you with some additional resources to plan and prepare your landscaping. This is just a brief overview of tonight's agenda. So um, when, when Damon talks, we're gonna be going over also what we do with, during red flag warnings and pg e public safety power shutoffs. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chuck. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, everyone, for attending tonight, and welcome. Um, I am going to talk tonight about um, East Bay Mud's strategies for uh, managing our our watersheds for uh, for fire, and and how we manage. Uh, uh, fire fuels on on our watersheds and how we prepare for and and prevent wildfires. Um, next slide, please. And what I'd like to start out with is um, so I'll I'll be referring to uh, two different watersheds throughout the presentation tonight: the uh, McCallamy watershed and the uh, the East Bay watershed. And I, I want to give some context to to where those those two areas are. 
Um, what we're looking at here is a, a, a map of our, really our entire water system. And if we look on the, the right side of this slide, at the McCallamy River watershed, that's really where, where our water is collected uh, through rainfall and uh, snowmelt uh, runoff um, in the uh, Sierra Nevada mountains. Uh, East Bay Mud collects that water in uh, Part E Reservoir, and it is conveyed to the service area through the McCallamy Aqueduct, which is the line that we see from the Part E Reservoir uh, to the East Bay. Um, so we manage the, uh, East Bay Mud manages the areas immediately around uh, Party and Comanche Reservoir, about 28,000 acres uh, in that area. And uh, we also manage the uh, area around the uh, terminal water reservoirs in the East Bay, where we have about uh, 30,000 acres. And next slide, please. So I'm going to cover a few. Uh, a few high points of our uh, fuel and fire management strategies on the watershed tonight. I'll talk a little bit about uh, the importance of our, our fire road network and how we maintain those, um, our strategic uh, fuel breaks on the watershed, and, and the diverse uh, sort of uh, tool set that we use to uh, uh, maintain those fuel breaks and to reduce fuels across the watershed. I'll also talk about our public education and fire prevention program. Um, and finally, how uh, uh, we are, East Bay Mud is equipped to uh, suppress fires and, and how we're trained to suppress fires um, when, when they do uh, uh, occur on the watershed. Next slide, please. Uh, so this first slide here, this first photo is of a uh, tractor that's being operated by an East Bay Mud Ranger uh, south of Moraga and the, this Ranger is mowing uh, one of our fire roads uh, on the Upper San Leandro watershed and uh, fire road mowing and maintenance is, is something that we engage in uh, every year. Uh, we remove the vegetation, uh, the, the new grass growth from these fire roads and uh, in some cases we use uh, heavy equipment bulldozers or road graders to, to make sure that the, the uh, fire roads are in good enough uh, shape to be uh, uh, passable over the summer. And fire roads really serve two functions. Uh, the first is really access. That's, that's what, a, what any good road does, is it provides access from one area to another. And as I mentioned, we have some pretty, pretty large watersheds to manage, and this fire road network allows us and allows firefighting resources access to uh, all, all parts of our watershed um, so that in the event of a, a wildfire or other emergency, uh, we can get emergency crews and firefighters in, uh, in to fight fires. Um, the, the other function that these fire roads serve, and, and this is a term uh, that I'll use a few more times throughout my presentation, is, is they serve as a fuel break. And this is a fuel break is an area where we break up the continuity of a fuel. So if we look at this road right here, we have grass growing on either side uh, by mowing uh, the grass uh, on the road. We actually uh, can do something ahead of time to slow down or, or hopefully stop the spread of a wildfire. Um, so those, those are really the two primary functions of our fire roads, access and uh, to establish fuel breaks. Next slide, please. Uh, focusing a little bit more on fuel breaks, um, the area that we are looking at in these two aerial photos, and, and these are a before and after, the photo on the left uh, was taken in 2018, and the photo on the right was taken in 2020. Uh, the road going through the middle of each picture is Lomas Cantatas Road. And the, it intersects uh, on the left side of the photo with Grizzly Peak Boulevard. So if you've ever been to the uh, Tilden steam trains, I'm, hopefully I'm drawing on the screen here and we can all see that. The Tilden steam train parking lot is right where that red circle is. Uh, so I just wanna give everyone a sort of a context of the area that we're looking at here. Uh, next, I wanna focus on the, the work that we've done here. So. As I said, the photo on the left is a before photo. The photo on the right is an after. And I want to highlight, and I'm drawing on the screen here, 
Uh, I want to highlight the area that East Bay Mud Crews, with the assistance of uh, CAL FIRE hand crews, uh, removed a significant amount of brush from uh, below Lomas Cantatas Road. So again, looking at the before picture, we have a lot of these little green circles that are all uh, coyote brush or baccarus uh, that we uh, removed uh, with, with chainsaws and, and hand tools. Um, and what this, this fuel break serves to do is, is really it serves the same purpose as I described uh, our, our fire road serving. We've uh, chosen a spot, um, a strategic location, uh, in this case at the, at the top of a, a pretty large canyon, where we have removed fuel uh, and with the idea that uh, should a wildfire occur uh, below this area, by removing the brush ahead of time, we can help slow or hopefully stop the spread of a wildfire. Uh, at the very least, we can take uh, a lot of the intensity out of a wildfire um, and make it a lot easier, hopefully, for firefighters to control or contain at this specific location. And I'll erase my drawings there and we'll go to the next slide. So uh, grazing uh, is really a, a wonderful fuel reduction tool that, that we utilize across uh, both our East Bay and McCallamy watersheds. And I've got two photos here. The photo on the left shows cattle grazing on the Pardee Reservoir watershed. And on the, uh, the photo on the right here are our friends, the goats on the East Bay watershed. Um, and the, the real advantage of grazing is that it's a fairly low impact, low cost method of removing fire fuels, uh, in this case grasses, on a, on a pretty large scale, a scale that we couldn't otherwise uh, really do any, any fuel reduction uh, using, you know, mowers or weed eaters or anything like that. They, these animals are just able to be a lot more effective over a larger area. Um, and if we can jump back to the previous slide just briefly, I want to highlight another uh, element here in the photo on the right. Um, and what I what I've highlighted here is a fence line, and this is a this is a grazing fence. And what that fence serves to do is keep grazing animals uh, on the inside uh, on our property and and off of Wilmas Cantatas Road. So a lot of our fuel treatments aren't just a uh, a one method treatment. In this instance, as I mentioned, we use hand crews uh, and chainsaws and, and hand tools to remove the brush, but we also put animals in this uh, particular spot uh, every year, every spring and into the summer. And those animals, as I mentioned, will graze down these grasses uh, in this area. And that just gives another layer of control um, that, that we can provide uh, should we have to suppress a fire in this area. Again, we've reduced the height of the grass. We've, we've really redu reduced the available energy for a fire to burn through um, and hopefully made that, that area safer and easier, control, easier to control during a wildfire. Next slide, please. And so I'm gonna jump in uh, into a little bit more detail here. This is actually the same, same project on Lomas Cantatas, but I wanna, I wanna illustrate um, kind of the, the, the work that it takes to do, uh, to do this fuel reduction work. Um, so this is a time-lapse video of a pile burning project um, where we are, uh, East Bay Mud Rangers are working in partnership uh, with Cal Fire uh, hand crews. And the crews and East Bay Mud Rangers have already gone in and removed the, the brush from this area. They've cut it and they piled it uh, and they wait for the brush to dry out and they wait for the weather uh, to be just right. And then we burn the piles. Um, and we, we do these sort of projects anytime we, we burn piles or, or uh, use fire as a tool. Um, we, we work in close coordination with our local fire departments with Cal Fire uh, and with the Bay Area Air Quality Management District or other uh, uh, air management districts to make sure that we're, we're uh, permitting these operations appropriately and that we're minimizing impacts uh, to our, our, our neighbors uh, from, from smoke or poor air quality. So we, 
we engage in these projects when, again, when weather conditions are, are right and we're, and we're not going to uh, um, put more smoke in the air than we would like to. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a video of a uh, understory prescribed burn. So this is a burn or, or a fire that was uh, intentionally set by our rangers and CAL FIRE and other local fire departments um, that is intended to remove fuel uh, or, or you know, really leaves and grass and, and pine needles uh, from underneath these trees that we can see. Um, Prescribed burning is really a sort of the, the pinnacle of, of fuel reduction work. It's uh, very, very low impact. Fire is a natural uh, part of the, the environment, especially in California. Um, but it's also the most complex um, and, and uh, sort of the uh, most difficult to, uh, to pull off. So we, uh, we engage in these projects, uh, again, in, in partnership with uh, Cal Fire, um, with local fire districts in this uh, instance, uh, with the Moraga Arenda uh, Fire District, and with the East Bay Regional Parks District Fire Department. So um, we, we only take these projects on, these uh, prescribed burn projects on when we can do, carry them out safely uh, and effectively and meet all of our management objectives. So this, uh, this isn't something that we do every day. These, these projects require a lot of uh, careful planning. Um, but when we can, uh, when we can carry out a prescribed burn, it's, it's really a good thing uh, for the land and for the watershed. Next slide, please. So again, we're looking at the area east of San Pablo Reservoir. So this is where that uh, prescribed burn in the previous slide was conducted. And uh, I, I wanna highlight um, this area for a specific reason. And, and again, we have a, a before and after photo here. The photo above was taken in 2020 and we're looking out across San Pablo Reservoir at a relatively large stand of Monterey Pines. Uh, the photo below was taken about the same time in 2021 uh, same stand of Monterey Pines, but as we can see, there's a lot more uh, brown or gray trees in that stand. Um, and we've, we've had a steady decline um, in the, the number of live trees in this stand over a, over a long period of time. We've been managing this, this uh, particular forest since 2001. Um, and, and we've been able to keep up largely by removing dead trees um, every year. Uh, that said, uh, drought conditions and uh, really climate change in general have accelerated the decline of this, this stand of trees. So we are uh, working uh, at a much faster pace um, and a, a much larger scale to remove these trees. And we anticipate uh, that about uh, 1500 of these trees will be removed this, uh, this fall or, or in early winter. Um, once, once conditions are right to do so. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a, a photo of uh, a horse logging operation. And this is an operation uh, that we, we used to utilize uh, in, uh, in the San Pablo Pines area. Again, the, the emphasis on our fuels treatments are uh, low impact. So uh, horse logging as opposed to a regular operation a regular logging operation using uh, machinery and log trucks uh, proved to be a much uh, much lower impact uh, way to manage these uh, dead trees in this particular stand. So again, we, we utilize a, a variety of techniques to manage uh, our forests and, and manage our fuels on the watershed. And, uh, our, our watersheds do also function uh, as a uh, a means for recreation for the public. We do we do invite the public onto our watersheds, onto our recreational trails, and and into our recreation areas, both in the East Bay and on, on the McCallum watershed. Uh, so we have a responsibility to uh, educate our visitors on on how to be fire safe, and and this is a uh, the type of sign that that uh, we see all over the state, um, and it's just a general fire danger sign. So this is sort of the um, you know, the, the easiest thing we can do to communicate uh, 
to our visitors when we are in a, a, a higher level of fire danger and, and warn them and help them understand that they need to be fire safe while they're visiting our watershed. Um, when we are, uh, you know, as we move farther into a fire season, uh, like we are now, um, we will often uh, implement restrictions beyond what we might normally see uh, during the summer. For example, uh, right now our um, watersheds are both under a uh, red flag event and that that's really a, a period of uh, higher fire danger than normal. We have low humidities and, and strong north winds. So during red flag events, we will often restrict the use of barbecues in our recreation areas or, or campfires in our campgrounds. Um, and in really extreme cases, we may also close facilities to the public um, if, there's a, if there's a very high risk for fire. Next slide, please. Uh, and so finally, you know, um, we, we spend probably the majority of our time managing fire in a, in a pre-suppression or a prevention mode. So doing all those all these activities that, that we've already seen in this presentation, um, fire road maintenance, uh, fuel break maintenance, all of that. But um, we, we know that at some point we will uh, have, uh, during a fire season, we will likely have a fire on our watershed. Uh, and when that does happen, uh, East Bay Mud Rangers are trained and equipped to respond to and, and suppress wildfires. And this photo here is, uh, shows an East Bay Mud uh, Ranger patrol on the goose fire on the party watershed that occurred earlier this year. Um, and, and so really uh, to, to, to summarize, we're, we're really looking at, again, a, a whole variety of approaches, of approaches to managing, managing fires on our watershed in the, both the uh, prevention or the, the pre-fire planning side of things, uh, right down to the, uh, right down to the suppression side, like we see here. And, you know, again, we, uh, this uh, the the effort to manage fire on our watersheds, uh, and I can't uh, emphasize this enough, is a partnership between East Bay Mud and our partnering agencies like Cal Fire, um, our, our local fire districts, our, our county uh, fire departments. Um, it's it's it really takes a lot of lot of work to get this this kind of stuff done, and and we rely heavily on those partnerships. And uh, with that, that concludes uh, my presentation. I will hand it over to uh, Dana. Um, Chuck, just uh, we had a question come in um, for you that we can take right now. So with fire season basically year round, do you ever treat areas more than once? For example, you graze in the spring, but if there is a late rain and the grass is growing in, do you go back and deal with the new ground fuels? Yeah, good, good question. So we do, and and uh, you know we didn't see that so much this year, um, but the la the the previous two years, twenty twenty and twenty nineteen, we had some late rains in the spring, and those rains were were followed by some really nice sunny warm days, uh, and at that point, a lot of our grazing animals had already been on the watershed for some time, and and were we're moving around on the watershed and, and we did have to evaluate our grazing strategy and move uh, move some of those animals back into areas that had already been grazed because we saw a, um, a large amount of growth. Um, the, the good news is, is that for the most part, we see the majority of growth of grasses in particular uh, occurs in the spring. So we, we work very, uh, very intensely in the spring and into early summer. Uh, on fuel reduction work and on, on managing our grazing. Um, but unless we, we have a really significant uh, rainfall event later in the summer or, or early in the fall, it's generally not, not something that we, uh, we have to address again. Great, thanks so much, Chuck. And so with that, we're gonna turn it over to Damon Baum, who's gonna talk about fire water supply. All right. Thanks a lot, Catherine. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so as we bridge our discussion from the watershed to the drinking water infrastructure, it's important to recognize that our watershed supplies water to our water treatment plants. Um, fuel management and fire prevention help maintain our high quality water. And um, if you move on to the next slide. 
So talking about water quality, uh, looking at Party Reservoir uh, in the Sierra Nevada foothills in 2013, the water looks great. Uh, it's a beautiful deep blue. And then you look at uh, Party Reservoir in 2017, and after years of drought and a fire in the watershed, uh, a wet winter flushed turbid water from the watershed into the lake. And the result is a murky greenish brown water. And some of our largest treatment plants weren't designed to treat this water. Uh, in the near future, we have plans uh, to implement projects to add processes that enable our treatment plants to treat the, the wider range of water quality. But until that time, we really depend on fuel management and fire prevention in our watershed as a water quality tool um, uh, to manage that for our treatment plants. Our next slide. Okay, so the next couple of slides I wanted to give an overview of the East Bay Mud water distribution system and, and describe how it's configured. Uh, then we'll explore how we provide water during fire weather events. So the East Bay Mud service area serves 1.4 million customers over 332 square miles in Alameda and Contra Costa counties. The service area spans along the San Francisco Bay, uh, along the East Bay shore, from Crockett in the north to San, Le San Lorenzo and Hayward in the south, and includes Oakland, Berkeley, Richmond, and San Leandro. The service area extends east along Highway 24 to serve the La Marinda community, and then it serves the I-80 corridor from Walnut Creek down to San Ramon. The service area also includes 125 pressure zones, which I will describe next. So in the East Bay Mud service area, we provide water service to customers ranging in elevation from sea level to 1500 feet above sea level. And this topography dictates how we deliver water to customers. The schematic shows how facilities work together in these miniature water systems called pressure zones. Pressure zones are usually about 200 feet uh, elevation bands. So from the water treatment plant, water is sent by gravity to a reservoir or tank in a low elevation base pressure zone. And if you give it a click, yes. Uh, next, an electric powered uh, pumping plant at the bottom of the zone boosts water to a reservoir at a higher elevation. And so this reservoir um, shows here as reservoir two, feeds by gravity this area in yellow. Um, so the, um, the reservoir just gravity feeds down and it helps to meet customer water demand and provides emergency storage, including fire flow. Um, the reservoir set a uh, pressure in the zone. So the residents at the top of the zone closest to the reservoir might have about 40 PSI, a little bit lower pressure, and then uh, near the bottom of the zone, um, a little bit higher pressure, somewhere around 130 PSI. So as you go up higher and higher in the, in the system, another pumping plant turns on and goes to the next higher reservoir. And at the top of this schematic, uh, it shows the, the highest reservoir, reservoir three, serves this pressure zone down below uh, in orange. And this process continues on and on as the system extends higher in elevation. All right, next slide. So all of our East Bay Mod water, water treatment plants are between an elevation of 200 to 400 feet above sea level. Uh, areas below the treatment plant are served by gravity and areas above the treatment plant require pumping. And you can see many of the gravity fed zones in orange here. Um, they're at lower elevations, mostly near the bay shore and a small area in Walnut Creek. And if you give it another click, and all portions of the service area in blue require pumping through a cascade of pressure zones to deliver water to customers in elevated regions um, in the East Bay. And so this applies to all the hillside communities that overlook the San Francisco Bay, the La Marinda community, and most of the San Ramon Valley south of Walnut Creek. So this partnership slide is intended to show that East Bay Mud can't manage fire protection and emergency response all by itself. We take a collaborative approach. So first I wanted to mention that East Bay Mud follows the state's standardized emergency management system. This allows East Bay Mud and other agencies to work together based on a similar emergency management and response framework. So the um, 
So East Bay Mud's also uh, part of the Water Agency Response Network with agencies throughout the state, uh, basically establishing mutual aid agreements to respond to emergencies, including fires. Uh, then there's the Hills Emergency Forum. Um, this was formed with local agencies and cities uh, to share information on East Bay Hills fire hazards. And the goal um, of this group is to build consensus on fire safety standards, incident response, management protocols, education, training, and fuel reduction strategies. And lastly, East Bay Mud hosts um, all fire agencies within the service area annually to discuss emergency preparedness, hydrant testing and maintenance, upcoming East Bay Mud projects, and general information sharing. So these partnerships are, are really important to support East Bay Mud's efforts to prevent and fight fires. Okay, now we move from the coordination to the infrastructure. So fire hydrants, um, they are, um, fire hydrants in the, in the water system infrastructure are what most people think of when fighting fires. And I'll discuss hydrants further in the next slide. Although important, there's a huge amount of infrastructure that's responsible for getting the fire suppression water to those hydrants. So whenever reservoirs are rehabilitated or newly constructed in East Bay Mud system, an analysis is performed to ensure fire flow storage is incorporated into the sizing. And additionally, uh, pipelines and regulator stations are designed with capacity to meet uh, local fire flow requirements. So hydrants are adequately supp supplied with fire flow. And then our emergency equipment, um, all East Bay Mud water treatment plants and key pumping plants have standby generators that can remain uh, operational. So to keep those facilities operational, if PG&E power is lost due to equipment failure or fire damage. And we also have portable generators and pumps. And these are deployed to pumping plants in fire prone areas during the wildfire season. And they help keep water moving up the hills during a, a power loss. Many of these uh, portable generators and pumps are about the size of large trucks and can be visible in your neighborhood. But keep in mind that they're essential for moving water in emergencies. So fire hydrants, um, they're the most visual, visible part of our water system. Uh, they're seen in most every street and every neighborhood. East Bay Mud hydrants typically have an East Bay Mud emblem on the top or an East Bay Mud sticker on the side. They have standard outlets per state guidelines to enable mutual assistance from other fire departments across California. And they're designed to meet residential or commercial fire flow requirements um, that were established at the time of installation. So East Bay Mud maintains the hydrants in our water system. They're inspected, tested, repaired, or replaced if they need, um, um, if they need to be. And that's because we wanna make sure that they're readily available for activation during a fire. Uh, fire suppression is the primary purpose of these hydrants. Um, but additionally, just wanted to note that East Bay Mud uses these hydrants for a wide variety of purposes. Um, that includes monitoring for leaks, monitoring pressure, checking local flow capacity, and collecting water quality samples. And we also use them as a, a point for flushing our pipelines. Uh, we use this to remove impurities and ensure water is uh, safe for public consumption. So now moving on to the topic of red flag warnings. Um, as we mentioned, oh, there is maybe one slide before this. Sorry. There you go. All right. Uh, so this presentation is pretty timely because we just had a red flag warning issue earlier today. Um, Chuck mentioned a little bit, a little bit about this in his presentation, but uh, the National Weather Service uh, we'll issue a red flag warning for a specified time and location when the uh, extreme fire weather conditions are present. And so those conditions could include high winds, low humidity, dry fuels, temperature, topography, and lightning strikes uh, are some of the factors. Uh, East Bay Mud, uh, when, an, uh, when a red flag warning is issued, the East Bay Mud Dispatch Center distributes those warnings to critical work groups and field staff like Chuck's um, are notified so they can avoid activities that could potentially spark a fire. 
And operationally, um, control room operators fill our tanks or reservoirs and keep them filled throughout the duration of the red flag warning in case we need to call upon that fire flow storage during a fire event. And this keeps uh, East Bay Mud in a state of readiness to prevent and to help suppress a fire. All right, next slide. So during normal operation, East, normal operations, um, East Bay Mud operators cycle tank uh, water levels between about 70% to 100% full. And during a red flag warning, uh, East Bay Mud operators top off the tank and keep them topped off for the duration of the warning. Uh, in this graphic, uh, homes at the highest, uh, in the highest pressure zone, shown here in red in the red flag area, um, those have the tank that is topped off to maximize fire suppression storage. And that's because this area is most prone to fire risk. Whereas the two reservoirs below um, are assumed to be not in a red flag area and um, don't need to have their reservoirs topped off. So we operate those reservoirs in a normal fashion. And moving on to the next slide. Um, now another timely topic, uh, PSPS. Since 2019, PG&E has implemented public safety power shutoffs. PG&E turns off power in advance of a severe fire weather event. Um, the intent is to prevent power lines from, inadvert from inadvertently igniting fires and keeping our community safe. Um, next slide. So East Bay Mud's in the business of supplying water and that goal becomes pretty difficult when PG&E is um, shutting off power and that power is unavailable. We can't treat and we can't move water through the system without power. So we need alternative sources of power. Um, we use diesel. Uh, diesel generators power our treatment plants um, and portable diesel generators and pumps back up our pumping plants. Uh, after completing an impact analysis, East Bay Mud determined where emergency equipment should strategically be deployed. And the map uh, over here on the left shows the starred locations of our portable emergency generators and pumps. So the water system operation during a PSPS event is similar to how we would operate our system during a red flag warning. The only difference is that we have portable generators and pumps in place to help um, aid us in operating the water system. So storage tanks are still filled uh, and remain filled in the PSPS affected areas. And this operation allows East Bay Mud to meet customer water needs while maintaining fire storage reserves, uh, uh, even, without East, uh, even without the PG&E power. So next slide. So one of our success stories uh, was one of the first and largest PSPS events that impacted East Bay Mud uh, in October of 2019. In preparation for this event, East Bay Mud closely coordinated with PG&E to identify facilities subject to power shutoffs. Uh, that coordination allowed us to pre-plan the deployment of portable equipment. So prior to the PSPS, um, we filled all of our tanks in the affected areas, and then the power was turned off. And during the multi-day power shutdown, over 200 East Bay Mud electric services were without power. Four treatment plants, 58 pumping plants, 54 reservoirs were all out of power. Uh, 73 of our 125 pressure, zone, pressure zones were impacted, and that's approximately 230,000 of our customers. So we reached out to our customers through social media and eastbaymud.com to conserve water. And the residents in those, in those affected areas responded by reducing their water use by 40%. Um, that was great. That helped uh, further boost our water reserves. Uh, we ran our standby generators, our portable generators, our portable pumps. Uh, we kept our tanks full and kept the system running and stabilized. And East Bay Mud and pg &E shared information throughout that whole process. Um, which was important because the power status availability and the weather conditions were constantly updating. Throughout the event, we were prepared if fire conditions worsened. And in the end, all East Bay Mud customers continued to maintain water service. Uh, their ice cream might have melted from their freezers not having power, but they still had water. All right, my next slide. All right. Um, so yeah, just wrapping up, East Bay Mud 
Uh, we take fire safety and fire prevention very seriously. Uh, we've taken numerous steps to prepare for the next fire emergency. Uh, East Bay Mud continues to coordinate with local agencies to, prove, to improve emergency response. Uh, we have infrastructure to support our fire suppression goals, and we've implemented our operational practices to prepare for a fire while keeping the water flowing, even when the power is not available. Great. Thanks so much, Damon. Thank you. We've been answering some questions as we go. Um, we got a question about flushing uh, hydrants. So um, how much flushing is needed to keep trihalomethanes or THMs within allowable levels? Can you just talk briefly about that? Yeah, there's, there's in that question, there's two topics. Um, one for trihalomethanes, we, we do a pretty good job um, at our treatment plants, uh, reducing the trihalomethanes in our, in our system. Uh, and, and when it gets into the distribution system, um, it's at pretty low levels. Um, uh, we don't normally need to do flushing uh, to get rid of trihalomethanes, but usually the flushing operation happens to um, move other impurities or air that's in the water, uh, that's trapped in the water, get that out so that um, the water is, is safe to drink for, for normal consumption. Thanks so much, Damon. So with that, I'm just gonna briefly go over some resources that are available to you to um, inform your uh, landscaping at your own house. So East Bay Mud has a brochure available on our website at evmud.com slash firescape um, that you can uh, download or order copies of, uh, actual hard copies of. Um, and it helps to uh, guide um, you know, your decision making in terms of how you would like to landscape your home, um, keeping in mind uh, how to reduce your fire risk. These are a couple of uh, pages I'm just going to go over from the, um, from the booklet. So this one talks about building design and vegetation. Um, obviously, the one on the left here is, is the no-no. Um, We've got flammable roof, we've got long um, overhanging eaves, you've got a bunch of tall grasses built up underneath the deck, um, uh, it looks very flammable. And then over here on the right, um, this you've got a tile roof, stucco walls, a short overhang, um, and then a tile deck with an underside enclosed. Um, you know, obviously, if you already own your house, it's uh, a lot more difficult to make these changes at this point. Um, but, you know, something to consider if you have to replace your roof in the future. So this one talks about the different landscaping zones. Um, so your defensible space is the first five feet from your home. Um, so you want to keep it clear of any kind of trees or brush um, in, within those first five feet. Um, the zone two, you want to reduce fuel load, um, so that's between five and 30 feet, um, and make sure that all of your, your trees and shrubs are planted uh, with a, a good amount of space in between them. And then zone three, trim and thin trees and shrubs, um, make sure that you remove any dead vegetation, um, and that, uh, you know, then trees are, um, uh, have, have a good amount of space in between them. And, uh, you know, one of the best things you can do is just maintain your landscape. So make sure that your landscaping is, um, uh, you know, it is, it is healthy, um, that you're not, you don't have big masses of shrubs, you don't have trees that are, that are hanging over top of your roof or into your chimney. Um, you want to use low ground cover or mulch. Um, so really, it's just all about wise landscaping. You want to make sure that you're, you're watering enough to make, that, make sure that your trees and shrubs are, are staying um, in good condition, um, but you don't want to obviously overwater. Um, and then, you know, just make sure that um, your, your home is, um, uh, you know, visible, that your, um, your address is, is clearly li uh, listed in case of an emergency. Um, and then we also always do encourage our uh, residents to have emergency water on hand. So two gallons per person per day in your family for up to five to seven days. Have some ready to go with you if you need to evacuate for any emergency. Um, you know, as much as you can possibly take um, with, you know, keeping in mind, you know, obviously we'll have a bunch of other stuff to take too. So, and then don't forget your pets also. Um, and then here's some uh, additional resources that are great for, um, you know, kind of more in-depth what types of plants and shrubs to use for landscaping. Um, we do have a list um, available also in that Firescape booklet that I, I shared with you. 
Um, this one here in the, in the uh, foreground is our um, EV mud plants and landscapes for summer dry climate. So we're going to be giving away three of these books tonight um, to some of our participants. And we'll also be giving uh, more away in our next webinar on September 15th. So hopefully you are available to, to join that too. Um, all of these agencies and um, organizations also have a, a ton of great resources that, that can talk about how your family and your home can stay more fire safe. So with that, um, I'm going to look at the Q&A uh, you know, Q&A box to see if there are questions that are, you know, pertain to some of the topics that we've talked about tonight. Questions that are very specific, um, you know, if you have questions about your own home, your, your billing situation, something like that, please um, contact us at waterwednesday at ebmed.com and we can get those questions answered. Um, and if we don't have answers for your questions tonight also, we will um, take note of them and follow up with you too. So, um, Lindsay, do you have any um, questions that you that have come in that we can answer live? Well, okay, so let's see. Um, oh. Yeah, so it does look like there are a couple for Chuck um, in regards to the, the first session about um, fire, fire prevention in terms of, um, you know, what, what happens to the goats after um, you know, when it's the off season, as well as a question regarding um, if we um, ask for ex expertise from indigenous um, people or indigenous organizations with, the no with their knowledge base of, um, of uh, using fire to suppress other fires. Yeah, so um, the, the goat question, yeah, we... Uh... You know, we we use those goats for as long as we need them, um, but then but then what happens when they're when they've eaten all the grass? Um, most of the the goat grazers that we work with, um, their their year is pretty booked up um, with with work grazing goats throughout the East Bay or or throughout the McCallum watershed. Um, so really, they they end up. Uh, those grazers end up rotating the goats from from one job to another, uh, if you will. Um, and then in the winter time, when when the um, grazing season, if you will, is over, uh, most of the grazers have a, a a pasture or a plot of land set aside specifically for wintering their goats, where they're they're not working to do. Uh, fuel reduction work or, or, you know, targeted grazing work, but they're, they're there to rest for the winter and get ready for the, the following fire season. <clears throat> oh, Catherine, you're muted. Sorry about that. I have to share a quick story. I talked with one of our goat grazers one time who told me that the baby goats, um, when they eat poison oak, their lips get irritated. So he has to go around and put chapstick on the baby goats and that is my new dream job. So, <laughs> okay. And I think that uh, Chuck, the other question was, um, do we talk to um, Native American tribes? Do we confer with them, um, you know, in terms of our, our uh, land management practices? Y yeah, yeah, we, we certainly do. And we have, um, you know, the, uh, as I mentioned that, that, uh, in the prescribed burning slide, um, that that's that's really a, a you know those projects are really a partnership. Those projects also require a lot of training and, and experience to plan and implement. And um, you know we we have uh, rangers on our staff who have attended uh, what's called a Trex event or a prescribed fire training exchange, uh, where they've actually uh, gone up to. Uh, I, I think the last instance they they took a trip up to Humboldt, uh, where they they worked with a variety of other agencies, the U.S. Forest Service, the National Park Service, and a, a really large number of uh, Native American tribes from that area uh, to really understand prescribed burning and and uh, forest management from a from a variety of different perspectives. Um, we've also had. Uh, Native American crews come uh, to our burns uh, in the East Bay. They've, they've come from as far as uh, near Placerville um, and, and they've come out to assist us with our burns. So 
um, that, that is a knowledge base that we, we like to tap, um, you know, the Native Americans know, know how to use that tool, uh, probably better than anyone and, and did do it for a long time. So, um, we, we do, we do learn whatever we can from them. Fantastic. We had a question about clarification of what I meant about um, two gallons per person per day. So, um, you know, we, we, we want our, our customers to, to be prepared for any emergency. So whether that be fire, earthquake, um, pandemic, or even just, you know, sometimes we have a main break and we will have to be out of water for the day. So we do recommend that everybody um, has water stored in their house. And we do have, if you go online to enuma.com that we have a bunch of um, tips on how to store water. Um, but we recommend two gallons per person in the house per day. Um, and for the longest time, um, it was, you know, for three days, but we really think that, um, you know, five to seven days, if you have the ability to store that much water is, is gonna be um, the best. Um, and, and also don't forget your pets. Um, and then we also had somebody who mentioned that um, Oakland Fire Safe Council, um, they had a homeowner webinar this year. Um, uh, so, and shared the link to that. So you can go to oaklandfiresafecouncil.org slash programs um, for some more information. Um, let's see. Um, so, and the rest of the questions, um, you know, I think we're gonna be able to answer offline. Um, oh, and just one other question. So Chuck, um, how, would, how would a person become a ranger if they uh, were interested? Yeah, good question. Um, so we, uh, we have actually just started a new uh, ranger intern program um, this, uh, this summer. And that'll be a, a recurring program. And we have positions uh, available both in the McCallamy watershed and in the East Bay. Um, so uh, keep your eye on the on the East Bay Mud uh, website for for those opportunities. Um, you know, we we also uh, do hire at a, a Ranger Naturalist Two level. So anyone who has a an interest uh, in in being outdoors and uh, you know working outdoors and and working in a variety of different environments and in inclement weather. Um, and who just has a passion for, for doing that sort of thing is, is welcome to, apl to apply. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Chuck and Damon. Um, so Lindsay, are we going to be able to do, uh, pick our winners tonight or will we have to do that offline? I think, I think we are ready. Um, okay. let me, uh, let me share my screen. I want to show people, um, the, the, the prize first. Bye. Um, let me just do this, share sound. Um, why am I not able to share my screen? Well, um, the prize you is had a, a, a image of it earlier. So we have our um, East Bay Mud uh, Native plant book. Um, it's a really beautiful um, hardcover book that we, it's hardcover right now. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it's, it gives all kinds of um, tips on landscaping using native plants. And if we can't do it tonight, so Lindsay is going to be doing a spin the wheel. Tip. Yeah, I don't know if I can, I can, I've got the spin wheel. Like, I don't think I can share it. Um, it only lets me share the whiteboard, but I can spin the wheel and let you know, and we can announce who, who yeah, wins. Let's, let's and do that. That'd be, be great. That'd be great. Let's do that. Okay. So, so um, yeah. So for people who joined in the first 20, 25 minutes, I got your name into a spin wheel and I am going to press it right now. So we, let's see who is our first winner. And we will follow up with you in an email about mailing it to you. So our first winner is Javon Wild. <laughs> um, I don't know if you want to write that down, Catherine. Uh, I'm not sure how to spell that, but. Um... Uh, 
Are you able to write it? Down? I'll write it, or actually, I'll, I can write it down. Let me. Great. I will write that down. So, Javon Wild, congratulations. Um, we have two more, two more chances. So let's see who else wins for today. And our second winner is Martina Lee. Congratulations. Okay. And our third and final winner for this round in Water Wednesday is Eric. No last name, but we've we've got your your contact, so we will be reaching out. And I just want to point out for people who didn't win, who are still interested in um, this plant book, you can actually look at it online as a database if you go to summer-dry.com. Or if you'd like to order it, you can also find it at ebima.com slash store and you can order it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay. So we'll be following up with those folks. And if you didn't win tonight, please join us on September 15th when we talk about a mastodon drink your water and I can prove it. Um, it's going to be a super fun one. So we hope to see you there. Um, and again, this, this is going to be recorded and it will be posted to our website at ebmud.com slash water Wednesday um, within the next week. So um, thank you so much to everybody. And if we, if we uh, didn't get to your question tonight, we'll be following up with you afterward. So have a great night. And thanks again.